most inclusively that you've worked for and, and why? What did you learn from them? It's um, a really hard question to answer um, because I've worked with lots and lots and lots of different leaders and some of them have really good qualities, some of them's not so good, but uh, t t an all-rounder. Who's been an all-rounder that I've found to be very aspirational would probably be Tim Fisher, who was the deputy leader of the National Party when I was first elected to the National Party. His nickname was Two Minute Tim because he was extraordinarily fair. He gave everyone two minutes. Um, but he, in that two minutes, he actually managed to be able to uh, get to the nub of what it was that you wanted to say and, uh, um, and was incredibly respectful in how he treated everyone. Um, uh, the party was a great party under him and uh, diversity um, was encouraged and uh, his, uh, his values were very strong. Great, thank you. Grant, may I ask you the, the same question? Um, John Schultz isn't in the room, is he? <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get that one out of the way. Um, um, no, no with, with all due respect to John, he's, he's been a, a strong advocate for this stuff, but I, it, um, we did cheat. I had seen this question before, yeah. Rebecca, so I've had time <laughs> to ponder it. Um, the person I'm actually going to uh, uh, talk about here is is actually Benita Dillon, who was my first manager when I joined the department up in the Riverland. And um, Benita is a fantastic human being. And um, I suppose back when I started in the department, um, some of the rounded edges I have now weren't as evident back then. So she was quite good when I would barge in the office and vent, just absorbing the vent. And then five minutes later, um, we'd work on a, on a solution and I'd walk out feeling better. And it just came naturally to her. The, the other beauty of, I suppose, with Benita's approach to things is that she always made time for people and she did actually inherit the job because Sonia Dominelli, who was the conservation program manager up there at the time, she was the manager that actually interviewed me in, the November, in November and then she went on maternity leave in January and Benita was a, a Riverland girl, had gone back up there with her, uh, with her partner to work and live and then she won the role. So she'd inherited this this team. So lots of newbies like me, I think there was three or four of us and then some old stages. So um, a, a blend of men and women, different age groups, different s at levels of experience in the public sector, but her demeanour and the way she actually went about managing that team um, through throughout what was a, a period of fairly significant change in the region, I think, um, was, was outstanding. So I actually learnt a lot from Benita. So there's lots lots of her approach or her leadership style that I've actually picked up and carried with me today. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. It's, it's amazing. I'm sure you can all think about this question for yourself as well and perhaps the most inclusive leader you've ever worked for. So definitely makes a difference, doesn't it, around how you feel around culture but also around performance of the team because there's so much research that, that shows that teams um, have an increased performance when you have that really good diversity of thought. All right. Can I add one more point? Of course you can. Sure. I was just reflecting why I couldn't find instantly in my mind a woman leader that I wanted to actually put up there on the pillar. And I've just been reflecting on you've been talking about um, who you've uh, put forward. And my experience is that most of the leaders that I've worked with are men and very, very, very few um, women at that, that high level. Uh, and the ones that I have worked with um, I wouldn't necessarily put up there as being good inclusive leaders. And the one thing I will say that I, um, I found most extraordinary is the old Queen Bee syndrome, that once you get to the top as a woman, you make sure no other woman follows you. And there's a lot of that in the environments that I've worked in. And so therefore it didn't necessarily jump to mind for me who was a... Um, a, uh, a significant woman leader, in the, in particularly in the political sphere. I know that's that would have been my experience in the private sector too, to be honest. There can be a, uh, some animosity between women at the top level, so, and which definitely is very disappointing. So, yeah. Um, I would like um, uh, Carleen and, and Grant to maybe comment on, um, in this day and age we know that it's not a good look to be seen not to having women around or having balance it's not the it's not a good look 
but fundamentally I think sometimes it's it's seen as political correctness but um, but actually some people don't actually see how important it really is for good decision making because some people would say you know in 1980 we had a fantastic committee in board and we did all these great things and they're all blokes then it was fantastic it was what you know there was no problem we actually achieved what we meant to achieve so I suppose the, I, my question is how do you go beyond that it's a political correctness to actually having people truly understand the value and why it's so important? It's an extremely good question. And I think the answer to that question comes from the proof is in the pudding. Those businesses that are being more diverse in their appointments at the senior management level but also on their boards, it's there's now a lot of research coming out to say that those businesses are significantly more successful. And so the success will tell the story in the longer run. Um, it's it's the time it's going to take to get that true gender equity. And um, I, once again, I'll go, it's not just about gender, it's about diversity um, altogether. Um, but but gender's the obvious one that we're dealing with today. Um, and I, I think that, um, that when you get the opportunity to be in that leadership role and everyone that's here today has a has a desire to be to be there and to do the best that you can in your in your sphere uh, and to be good strong inclusive leaders is to make sure that what you do reflects that best practice and so therefore your job and the work that you do uh, is evidence of, of why it's so important to have women in those roles and it will be the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, great question, Julia, um, and agree strongly with what Carlene said. I, if I reflect back to what I said uh, when I was speaking before, so um, really trying to find a, a quantitative measure for what is a qualitative problem at times for this is that, it, that presents the challenge. From Males Champions of Change perspective, so I mentioned before about James Fazzino, the, the Chief Executive of Insight Tech Pivot. Now, he spoke to us recently at our, our, our meeting over in Melbourne in October and so this is an $8 billion company which is dominated by engineers and scientists. So um, they've come from a place where the majority of their workforce is male. They are subject matter based, um, you know, they're recruit, recruited for subject matter expertise and technical expertise. So they are as dyed in the wool in their approach to, to, as you can get in any sector. What he was able to do through setting targets and making changes in his leadership cohort and then his management cohort across his sites is actually tangibly demonstrate increases in productivity. So he's able to talk about it in from the balance sheet perspective that this plant is now 40% more productive under that woman than it was under the bloke that was running it for 15 years before. He's able to hold it up. One of our challenges, I think, with... Um, in our line of work is that we we don't um, we struggle to actually be able to demonstrate that. So those studies that Carlene's been talking about actually raising the visibility and awareness of those um, I think is really important because we don't all we're not all like James Fazzino. We don't have a balance sheet from a you know a, a financial or economic perspective that we can turn to to say well, well I've made these changes and look there's the proof it's in the pudding. So, um, so I think, yeah, the, the more that the research um, is pushed out there and the more that it extends into the community and, the, you know, the broader thinking, the better. Um, and there's a lot of literature out there now about that, yeah. Would that evidence exist? How do we get those people who need to be at functions like this or who need to get on board with uh, equity in the workplace and diversity, how do, we, how do we actually do that? How do we get practically get those people, those leaders involved make it part of their kpis <laughs> ditto S simple as that i i think um creating space is one thing um but you're not going to necessarily uh, sometimes you don't change people unless you change people so if you've got people that don't want to buy into that approach then yeah perhaps they need to look elsewhere i, I know there's a there's a few questions up, kind of the practical questions in the workforce. Um, there's ones about, uh, you know, young women wanting to start a family, but um, making sure contracts, because a lot of people here would be on contract employment, that you're, you're not uh, disadvantaged by that. But there's, and there's been a few others around that. So practically in the workplace, 
uh, so people's careers can uh, withstand the, the changes that, that family requirements um, cause. Any, any comments or any input to those, those sorts of issues? Um, I would only say to that, that question is that um, flexibility is about flexibility both ways. Uh, and you have a responsibility to demonstrate how you're going to constructively be able to come back to that contract and that workplace um, following your decision to, to have a family as well. So it's incumbent upon you uh, as an individual making the, um, the decision to, to have a family or maybe not, maybe it just happened, um, and uh, and then, then proactively working with your boss on what your return to work program is going to look like well before you leave and set in place the um, the um, the process of of how your job is going to be managed and make it really simple for your boss, whether your boss is a man or a woman, to have you back in the workplace at at the time that's um, most suited to you. And if you take a proactive um, approach to it um, in that context, it'll, it'll be better received than if you just take the maternity leave and then expect the space to be there for you when you get back. Likewise, I agree strongly with what Carlene said. I think. Um what I've, I've noticed in my time in the public sector, there's been significant improvements in this area, but it, it's still there's still further work to do. And I think being clear to um, around maternity leave arrangements, how you return to a role, and then keeping that so having that crystal clear before you you go on your maternity leave, but then continuing the conversation while you're on maternity leave as well to track um, track how how people are feeling um, because let's be honest when you're a parent um, for the first time or the second time or the third time it presents different challenges and it changes your perspective on things so that dialogue while you're away from work I've, I've seen some examples where that's been managed really well in our group I've also seen some examples where it's been an abomination and that um, the challenge is that a person gets back to work and they feel like they're an afterthought or they've been sidelined and that gets back to all of the speed humps and impediments that I was talking about before. That that really is career lim limiting because it disempowers people. So um, I think from the agency's perspective, we've got, con you know, the managers need to put more time and effort into that, acknowledging that it's a, you know, it's a two-way... How do we encourage as male and female leaders and managers, the people who are working with us, to have the confidence to put their hand up to accept the, the matters you're talking about in terms of you only tick three of the ten boxes. How do we, how do, we do that practically in the workplace? Well, in my workplace, I always um, have the view that if I can't um, be replaced, I can't be promoted first and foremost, so I make sure I surround myself with people who know how to do my job. Um, the second thing um, that I always did was... Um, as, as a manager, um, was to strongly encourage people to, to follow their dreams and their ambitions. So as a leader, it's critically important that you you acknowledge that your time with that person is, is a passing time, that they're moving through their career and that you have the opportunity to be a positive influence on where they end up in their career. And so you work with them to create the opportunity for them to be their best um, and being their best may be that they shouldn't be working in the environment they're in they should be moving on to the next bigger brighter thing that they're doing and so from a leader's perspective you've, you've got to encourage and be excited by people's opportunities and uh, not feel threatened by the fact that these people are making you look good at any particular point in time so you don't want them to leave um, and having that um, that uh, that um, understanding of how important it is to to encourage and um, promote people through their careers and and not try to lock on and keep them but as a as a person who is um, who is moving through that yourself um, don't be afraid to talk to the people above you about your ambitions and what you might like to do. And that the opportunity to get experience in applications is just as important as having the opportunity to, to apply for a job and get it. Um, because that experience in application can throw up a whole range of different challenges to yourself, yourself personally be that you might not have actually realised that you um, you were not dealing with. And so, um, you know, I would I would suggest that in your human resources departments, you you encourage them to to get people to, to tap people on the shoulder and tell them you might not have all the criteria of this, but I think it'd be really good for you to apply. It'd be a great experience for you to apply. And and the same with you and your colleagues in in your workplace. Encourage those around you to apply to do things um, that are outside their comfort zone. Um, 
couple of points I guess I'd add to that. So um, I think the notion of uh, recruiting for attitude and training for skills or expertise is never more true with this. So I think if you recruit people that have got an attitude and a want and a desire to learn and improve, then the rest will look after itself. So that's the first point. Second thing is if you're a manager and um, you're not selfless in that approach in terms of trying to make yourself redundant and do yourself out of a job, um, then I think you need to question why you're in that sort of role in the first place. And that's linked to the first the first comment I made because I think I reflect on our organisation. We do recruit quite often strongly for subject matter expertise and if people feel threatened by the opinions of others who have similar subject matter expertise but a different opinion, then that stymies that development. It does. And then finally, I, I suppose for me, um, you know, if I reflect on myself, I'm a product of opportunity um, and um, I haven't thought twice. So Carlene's point before around women processing this stuff different to blokes, it's, it's absolutely spot on. I, I haven't thought twice about any of the steps. I haven't had a plan or that I've followed from a career. It's just jumped. So you, you jump in the, in the deep end of the pool and without your floaties and you paddle the top and it works its way out. And if I, re I reflect on what Carlene had said, I mean, my wife recently went through a process where she's applied and won a role to be the director of a childcare centre. She was analysing that to within an inch of its life before she made the decision. And um, Nick can tell me, can attest that she was actually, uh, I was actually getting quite frustrated with her because she's overthinking it. She knows the stuff back to front. She's very good at her job. She's got a desire to learn. Why wouldn't you, you don't get fixated on whether you apply or not, let it roll. And she did and she got the job. But the, the, there was, a, you know, it's just a crystal clear example for me there around the difference. So I think what the, the point I guess I would make, again, to the male leaders in the room, and we've still obviously, you know, our leadership at senior levels in the agency, we've got to adopt an approach that actually enables that thinking amongst the women in our workforce as well. Because um, if we don't, it'll be to our great detriment. Thank you. I guess the, there's one further point I'd like to add to that. Look at those 10 criteria and go, I've got those two, but geez, I'd love to learn those other eight. <laughs> and how am I going to learn them? I'm going to learn them on the job um, because that's where you get your experience. And I'll, I'll give you a little example um, because that's a really good one of your wife's example. My sister is a, um, a manager of casinos for Royal Caribbean cruise ships, so travels the world, and she's been doing that for 18 years. Great job. She's decided that she wants to come back to land and is looking for what her land job looks like, and she does doesn't want it to be in casinos. And she brings to me a job advertisement that is a project officer with the Children's Commissioner in the Northern Territory and says to me, can I do this job? How do you relate a casino job, managing a casino on a cruise ship, to working with the Entei Children's Commissioner on a project around children in detention? The first thing she said is, I'd really like to make a difference. That was principle number one. She wanted to do something that was worthwhile. You know, taking money off people gambling hasn't been, you know, a, a great worthwhile <laughs> job in her, her mind. So she really wanted to do something worthwhile. So the principles that you're, you, of why you're going for the job are really important. Does that job meet all the principles and values that you want to do first and foremost? That's not written in the job description, but have a good look at that first. And if that does and you've got a couple of the key criteria, and they don't even have to be the key criteria, if you've got the right attitude because the job reflects where you want to go and your values, then you're going to have a much better chance of getting the job. So I went through the job description with my sister and the first one is, you know, needs to write policy, needs to do this. She said, I've never written policy. I said, you've never written policy for government, but you've written policies every single day of your life for Royal Caribbean. She said, you've got to learn to, you've got to deal with different cultures. You employed at least 80 different cultures on every ship that you had to deal with on a daily basis. So, you know, just break it down to, to real life experiences that you did, not necessarily in the same sector, but have you had an experience that can be related to that part of that that job description. And it doesn't need to be a qualification. It doesn't mean to need to be a direct job. But have you had an experience that might be relevant to that and then flog that in your job application? I'll take a... My approach will be a pitch it from a departmental perspective. I am uh, genuine in what I said before around um, the, the need to maintain momentum around this activity. So we're in a period of transition now. Our three-year plan is is now coming to a close and we're working towards what things will look like going forward. Um, I guess I would encourage all of you to think about that and in, engage in that discussion um, as we transition to a new arrangement because I think it would be... Um, 
we've got a rich opportunity here to build on what is, I think, a really solid solid foundation. We've done some stuff for the last two or three years which I think is best practice in the public sector. We, As an agency we're not where we need to be yet but um, if we maintain that momentum I think we can we can really improve the culture of the joint. So it's an open invitation to all of you to go back into your work groups and talk to your people and then come back to us with your suggestions to how this might look. There's nothing like name and shame to make people do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And I would encourage every single one of you here, male and female, to bring a male friend with you next time. And, and hopefully that be a male friend who is a boss. Okay? And if you're failing getting into the KPIs, ask them. And when they don't come, then you can point that out to them at a later date. Grace. <laughs>